So welcome everyone to the fourth iteration of our interview series for the Products of Empire exhibition now on view at ArtShare LA. I'm your curator, Badir McCleary, and I have the esteemed honor of welcoming one of our featured artists, an amazing, amazing person, Mr. Abel Alejandre, to the, to the session today to be able to talk about his amazing works in the show and how they relate to the theme and just his art practice in general, um, and also get a little bit of background on the works, some of the questions that I have personally, and you know, just allowing Abel to talk about um, the creation process of the work. It's a few things that I learned on opening night that I want him to kind of reiterate because I thought it was super cool. Um, but like I said, I'll let him do that. Welcome, Abel, and thanks so much for being here today. Well, th thank you for the invitation. I, I appreciate being part, part of the exhibition. And uh, it's, it's pretty cool uh, to, to, to do something <laughs> in these trying times, right? Right. right. It's good to feel a little bit of agency. <laughs> Man, tell me about it. And like, you know, that's kind of, it's, it's it's awesome that you say that because, you know, right now, everything that we're going through is from humanity, especially in this country, is a product of the empire that we're under. You know, so a lot of people will look at it and say, well, there's people that are, you know, in abundance, you know, they're making more money than they ever had before and all those things. But there are the other side of the coin where there's people that are products of that empire that are doing worse off, you know, that are, you know, trying to just make ends meet. And a lot of things are happening on both ends of the spectrum to a lot of people. And I thought um, the title of the show um, and the theme too, you know, was very apropos for the moment. And one of the things I love just to start was, you know, that the writing of writing the unicorn painting, because immediately when I saw that, I said, man, this is exactly how I feel. You know, like every day where, you know, you feel like you got the bull by the horns and next thing you know, he's kicking you in the face and you're, and you're off of him. Then you got to hop right back on and repeat the process. What was the thoughts about what were you thinking about, I guess, in creating this work? Well, you know, as far as like the, uh, like this image, I, I've, I've been wanting to create it for, for a long time. And I like playing with uh, uh, American uh, sayings, mm -hmm. you know, like, 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 as you just stated, you know, riding the bull by, by, by the horns. Yeah. And there's, uh, I just feel like, you know, as an outsider, I've always felt as an outsider, mm -hmm. is that there's all these white cultural secrets that I'm not a part of. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm always trying to, you know, uh, unravel and, 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 you know, unpack what, what, what people mean by things. And I come to different conclusions than other people because uh, uh, I don't have the same, uh, same experiences. Yeah. Um, but that being said, the piece is uh, what I wanted to do a political piece, a personal piece, you know, my work deals with uh, masculinity, mm -hmm. but it's not masculinity coming from uh, a Chicano, a Latino, Latinx experience. It's, 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 it's more universal. Masculinity as, in, uh, as it deals, you know, in, on a more universal uh, um, sort of way, right? So like men across race, and age and culture, we're, we're pretty much uh, the same yeah. as far as like how we think and, and you know, and our role in, in, uh, in society. So I wanted to have this, you know, uh, this bull that, you know, in this case represents like, you know, Trump. Mm -hmm. And so if you notice, there's a 45, um, 45 on, yeah. on the bull. <laughs> and Trump became a vessel for like the old regime trying to hold on as as I see it yeah. and you have all these people that think they can control him and you know your 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 fox your 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 conservatives your pundits your the old guard right and so that's that's who uh, that's the undercarriage here there are all the people that think they can control him at the end he's looking back at the audience and saying what what do you want from me yeah you no know, you know I'm just a bull yeah you know it's like so and like we can dress him up and and, and create in, in, in this image of him as if he were you know like the savior you're looking for or the villain you're looking for 
But at the end, he's just him. Yeah. Like, he's no more a villain now than he was before. He's no more a hero now than he was before. Yeah. And he, he's, he's just him. And so I just wanted to, you know, to, to show this, that the, the, the performity of it all. And I, 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 I specifically put a, 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 a Mexican cowboy uh, uh, writing him since he came into, you know, like international like presence, you know, he claimed his international presence truly and fully by accusing Mexicans of being murderers and rapists, you know, what have you, right? So I, I, I chose this, this figure and uh, it, part of it is my, my, own, um, my own Mexican sense of humor. We're, 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 you know, we, we, uh, we like poking fun at misery. And, and, and that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a Mexican tradition. It goes back, you know, uh, 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 centuries, you know, I'm sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so, so that's what I wanted to do. And, you know, I, I wanted to uh, kind of create the old guard and like just trying to hold on. And everybody's trying to hold on is the familiarity of it. You know, it's like, it's, you know, it's the devil we know. And, but really it, it, it opens, it's opening up the gates to a new world. One that we don't know, we don't know what's next. Yeah. A lot of norms were broken, you know, uh, so, you know, in, in society and in, 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 in government and, you know, and in all sorts of, of, of ways that we don't understand yet. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wanted to just illustrate that, 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 that uh, curated chaos. Yeah, I always wanted to, I guess the question I had too is like the people, you know, that are, you know, they kind of have the puppeteer uh, gauges or sticks or controls. Are those people representative of this Illuminati that controls Trump or is that us? Is that, are those the civilians that are controlling the bull? I always wanted to kind of, because, you know, the news and, you know, just public opinion can sway a bull too. Well, it, it's, it is um, the real and imagined mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. puppeteers, right? The, 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 the people who think that they control the narrative mm. and the people we imagine control the narrative, yeah. including us, right? It, you know, like, like we think we understand what happened. I don't believe that we do. Yeah, I know, I don't. Uh, it, but, you know, like everybody will tell you what it meant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and I don't know. I don't know that anyone can or will for a long time because yeah. a lot of things were happening that, that you know, uh, uh, you know, behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. uh, things that not even the individuals that were causing them are aware of each other's, you know, uh, Very true. you know, uh, um, acts and how it, it, it impacted other people. So, so I, I don't know. And so even these people are hidden from each other. So they don't, you know, like none of us really know. And so like for me, you know, it, we, we, when we talk about like, empire products of empire like this is it right that, that mm. we uh we're just we're just like the the uh when i think of like when a when a piece of metal is being machined and all mm -hmm. this like you know like little pieces start flying off it, that's that's what it is like it, it, all these little pieces are coming mm -hmm. off the, the the machine the metal there's little shavings yeah and you know independent of each other and we don't know when we were discarded, if we were going we to be repurposed, but you know we're no longer part part of it. It's very it's very interesting. And one thing I've noticed too on here, I I literally just noticed this right now. There's two tails on the bull. Yeah. Well, I wanted I wanted to uh, I didn't want him to be just a bull because for. We, we are adding attributes that he really doesn't possess, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and for me, Trump is more than a person, you know, it, it's the phenomena. Yeah. And, and so everybody is, you know, adding or subtracting, in most cases, adding, to, you know, to, to the mystery, to the phenomena and to the person. But in this case, like I wanted to, I wanted to create like, this uh this magic unicorn <laughs> right like it's like how can i make them more magical yeah more, but at the same time 
at the same time uh ridiculous yeah. like in, in in our assumptions yeah and so it's like you know like like i heard like uh some some just absurd and ridiculous uh people uh saying that you know he was the second coming you oh know, people, yeah people like on the religious right but yeah. This this is not your, your your standard people. These are people that are on the on the fringe of the religious right. Mm -hmm. That you know, like they really felt that God really sent him, and uh, and God, I I I I, I hope that uh, that's not the case. <laughs> but you know, the, but the, this, but what I what I meant to convey is that we are making, we're creating something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 more in the imagined column rather than the real. Yeah. And, and, and we just we just keep attributing more and more traits to him that he does not possess. Mm. And so, uh, and to me, this was you know, like if you think of a bull, a bull does not have a a, a unicorn horn and doesn't have two tails. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, so so I wanted to just make it a little bit more ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, it's. I mean, it's. It's so apropos, you know, for, you know, the times that we're living in, because there are some things to where it happens to where it's like, it is ridiculous. Like, you know, for instance, I read something in the Daily Mail this morning where they said the administration to help, you know, drug addicts and things like that, they're going to do taxpayer funded crack pipes in a sense or something like that. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, whose idea was this? You know, like if this is true, I mean, it was in the Daily Mail, you know, they're, you know, they're pretty reputable. It's UK, you know, so you kind of sometimes you have to look outside to kind of get the truth about American news, uh, like with BBC and others, because, you know, the news is so politically based in our country. You can kind of get the blue side with, you know, MSNBC or whatever and the red side with Fox. So it's like you, you hear of these type of things and you're like, this world is just getting crazier and crazier. So when I see this and I, and I look at it and it's like that bull is so representative of where we are with, with two tails and a unicorn, because one day America can be, you know, the great country that, you know, we all believe it is and that it can be, you know, in the future. But on the flip side, no matter what's, you know, how the tail swings, it can swing just as easily. You know what I mean? Like just how the wind blows, you know, America is very shifty in that regard to where no one, one moment, literally, like it could be America's doing great and in the next hour on the next show, they could talk about a downtrodden economy and it kills all, you know, hope and momentum for, you know, coming out of any type of financial, emotional, or spiritual depression from a pandemic. So it's, I, I felt that just really struck, especially, you know, in leading the exhibition. It was, it was just, man, it, it, it hit super hard, super hard. Well, without any explanation to anyone that, that saw the work, a, a lot of people were taken by it. And I, uh, so I, I felt like I, I must have done something right with this piece because <laughs> uh, people just kept wanting to talk about it. And, and not necessarily to me because they didn't know that I was the artist. You know, like I could hear them, I could see them, and and and, and people were just dragging, you know, people into the room and says, so like, "Oh, look, look at this." Yeah. Um, I, I like that about any work that can stand on its own w without having someone to, you know, uh, come and apologize for it. You know, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know. It, it, as you were saying, you know, like, uh, uh, I just wanted to add this, you know, uh, about our times here in America, even though all that is happening, I still rather be nowhere else than here. Yep. You know, it's like, uh, you know, like, this is our country too. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, like, it's not, it, it's, it's not just one, one side. And it's not, that, it's not that it's not their country. It's all yeah. our country. It's all so it's like, yep. And so, you know, like, just like anyone else's opinion is valid, you know, uh, so is mine. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So the, the next piece I thought was, you know, really, really, you know, fitting for the exhibition as well, especially with the title, uh, The Gatekeeper. Uh, 
I, I, I laugh at that because, you know, especially in things like the NFT world, Web3 and all that, the whole goal for artists participating in Web3 has been to avoid the quote unquote gatekeepers, you know, in the art world, you know, the Gagosian galleries, the large collectors, the big brands that seem to uh, overtake um, exhibition opportunities and residencies. Um, and we all know that like after a while, it all just assumes itself anyway, and it's now going back to traditional gatekeeping ways. Um, but I felt in this context, you know, the gatekeeper for the products of empire was like, you know, the, the unemployment offices, you know, the, the vaccinations, you know, uh, these, all of these things that are not, I, I would say not human caused in a sense, um, but you need to deal with these places in order to progress in life. You know, I know a lot of people over the pandemic, you know, lost their jobs and were hit hard. I mean, a lot of people immediately were hit hard to where they had to depend on stimulus, you know, and things like that to make sure that they can put food on the table, you know, and that gatekeeper at that moment was the U.S. government or your local municipality that delivered finances to your home via the stimulus or the check. So it was like you were, most people were beholden to that gatekeeper to live. You know, like that was, that was really, really key. And I, I related it to, you know, the art world because a lot of artists feel that they need to align themselves with these quote unquote gatekeepers to live as an artist, to make a career as an artist, especially in our city of LA, you know, where we see a lot of, you know, relationships disappear because of opportunity and chance. Um, and we see how those gatekeepers operate to manage and maneuver um, opportunity throughout uh, this art world. So I also looked at it and, you know, got a real vibe of kind of like a, the old uh, psychedelic posters from the 70s. Right. It, it gave me that vibe as if like, you know, I, I was, it was, it was almost like, like those posters, but also in the Afro Cobra, you know, vibe in Chicago, where it was a lot of, you know, color, even though this was muted in black and white, I still, in a sense, saw color in the, the bands of black and white. Can you talk about this piece more? I mean, I know I went, I kind of gave my whole soliloquy, but I just, I, I, I appreciate it so much. Well, you know, uh, stylistically. Pardon me. Oh, sorry, my. Uh, I just <laughs> couldn't get rid of this notification to update my uh, OS. <laughs> oh man, stay away from Monterey. It's caused me uh, so many problems. Darn it. I oh, apologize for that. No, no worries. This drives me nuts. I I want to. If, if for nothing else, I want to win the lottery so I never have to touch a computer again. Oh, man. Like, that's, that's like, you know, what my mom and them say. She's like, well, if I, if I get rich, I can just pay somebody to do this for me. I don't have to worry about it. And I'm like, well, you're right, you know, but it's cool using a computer. Yeah. Well, um, the, uh, the gatekeeper is really... Um, a piece that, that uh, like I, I feel that my work is is, is shifting, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and a, a part of my aesthetic, part of like what informs my, uh, you know, like my visual vocabulary is those psychedelic posters, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, like and some of the, the uh, like the propaganda graphical, you know, yeah. uh, silk screens, you know, of World War Two, you know, like the the, the the they're they're very evocative. Yes. You know, uh, yes. and so I, I, I wanted to have that that uh, old style propaganda, uh, uh, you know, with a, a, a little hippy dippy, you know, yeah. uh, you know, feel. But you know, you know, colored and flavored with with my own, my own style of you know it, it being monochromatic, and you know, and, and coming from you know my my uh, some of my experiences, mm -hmm. you know, informed by my experiences, and. 
in this case, I wanted to have uh, these uh, these these two characters, like they are clearly they're two different individuals, but they're really one. There's is a is a two headed gatekeeper, mm -hmm. you know. And, and like uh, I like I like pulling a little bit from like uh, Greek mythology and, and you know yeah. invented mythology. Uh, I'm really big on inventing new mythologies. No, that's and, that's uh, dope. We invent mythologies every day just by and, living. Uh, and you know, and I feel comfortable with that. You know, I, I don't know if you uh, um, how you grew up, but like when I was a kid, my my mother always lied to me about like just like the craziest shit. You know, like like she would just say, "I know what you're doing." A little bird told me. Yeah, <laughs> and it's like I knew that no one told her, but like, but 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 she really wanted me to believe that it was a bird, a talking yeah. bird that was yeah. that was uh, was informing on me, and I just I like, and I just got fascinated by you know like these like you know uh, this you know like individual customized myths, these little testimonials. Yeah, and like they're, they're like just this, this, this little vignettes. Yeah. Right. And and so I like that. And so I've incorporated that into my work, you know, where I could just I'm just gonna make up a myth. And so in this in this case, it's this two-headed guardian, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh the the, the uh, two uh one one an actor and one an artist. Uh Mario Ibarra is uh on, on the right on the right and the the uh the other one, uh, I, I'm not gonna forgive myself uh, if I, I can't remember his name. Is it's at the tip of my tongue, um, but he's he's over in China. But like, but they they, they both have model for me, in uh, in but he, you know by not not in China, but here in my studio, and and I wanted to uh, mash them together as a as a two headed you know uh, mythological guardian, mm. and and. The, the way that, that I interpreted this is that you would have this new generation that, you know, with, with access to, to the internet, with access to social media, that now we have a, we're in a position where no matter what institution tells you, you can, you can fight back. You can literally fight back. You have the platforms, you have the voice, you know, um, uh, and you can be drowned out by other voices, but you ha you have a, a, an opportunity to fight back. So the way that, that I visualize this is having this this uh, this this guardian who uh, can can um, fight against and, and find allies, you know. Um, and, and so so by you know by by having these two different distinct groups with maybe two different agendas, they come together and have a shared agenda and become like like one entity. And so in this case, this would be this, this guardian. And so this, is, this piece was more about bringing uh, um, two different you know, um, groups together yeah. and, you know, and, and fighting uh, a cost to, the, to, to defend itself. Um, it's, it's so I mean, that, that's, that's what I, what, what, what I, where I was going with it. Like what, what was the significance of the hands? Like I've, Ever since I've you know studied Charles White, I've been a huge fan of artists that can really, really draw hands and bring out textures and the life inside of hands. Being that the hands are a very you know central figure in this work, almost more prominent than the subjects themselves. What do what do the hands mean to you as the artist? Well, to me, whenever I use hands in an artwork is to indicate that, that the individual, the subject has agency. Mm, mm -hmm. And to hide the hands, if I do that, is to indicate that the, the, an impotence that, that the, the, the subject has. And so by, by, by showing the hands, you know, those hands can, can ask for help, can, can shake, or can make a fist. It's agency. Yeah, you know, and and that's how I, I I like to you know to utilize the the hands in my work. It's beautiful. So what what made you focus on black and white as you know? And I look at it. I don't even see it as black and white in this case. I see it as you know two sides of negative space. 
Um, what, what made you choose that combination to fill out around the uh, character? Well, I, I stopped doing color, uh, I don't say like 25 years ago. Mm. Uh, uh, I did color for a while. I, I started uh, my art career in 1984 doing murals for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, what I found at some point in my, in my career that everybody told me I was a good painter. Nobody said I was a great painter but that I was a good painter. And they would say, oh, this reminds me of this artist. This reminds me of that artist. And I was not, I was not distinguishing myself from anyone else. Mm -hmm. So I, I stopped doing color because it's like, I was like, well, I need, to, I need to pull back and I need to, I need to peel back the layers mm -hmm. and, and, and go down to my core and then let my work stand on its own. And if people still remember me, you know, like I wanted people to remember me because it's my work, not because yeah. it reminds them of someone else's legacy. Oh, no. I'm not trying to extend anyone's legacy. I'm trying yeah. to stop with my own. Yeah, so, I, I think that's a, a, an issue with a lot of artists today is, you know, there's a lot of uh, dedication painting. Um, right. And I say that, you know, not to be, I guess, mean to any any artists that are emerging or, you know, really doing a, a painting and dedicating to dedicating it, the style to their favorite painter. But I, I would suggest, you know, don't let that be what represents you. You know, if someone can say, oh, you know, that piece reminds me of something of, of an artist or whatever, um, then you, okay, cool. That person, that viewer might have a limited view of art history or a limited view of the artist that they've seen. So they're trying to relate to you. But if they look at every single painting and say, that reminds me of that artist, then we have a problem. So I totally agree. I, I, I totally hear you on that one because there's, you know, that's an issue of, you know, development, like being able to, like you stepped outside of what people, what many artists wouldn't do is just say, you know what, I don't want to be known for that even if it you know will put me in a certain situation i want to be known for whoever i am and whoever i'm going to be and i think that's that narrative right there is key so if any artists emerging that are you know listening and watching like please take heed to that that was great advice you know and in and, and that same spirit i um i started looking at art magazines you know like art news art america art forum and I started taking inventory of the content of all the work that mm -hmm. was figurative. And it was between 80 to 95% of women. Mm -hmm. but it didn't matter if the artists were men or the artists were women. And I know why that is, because it sells. It sells, yeah. You know, uh, I could make a very attractive, uh, um, you know, woman and, and put her in my work. And I know that I would I would have bigger sales. Mm -hmm. So like, what would what would be the most the more challenging thing for me? And so then I decided to my focus was going to be on my on men, and, and, and you know and you know and it just and talk about more of like my own experience instead of telling someone else's story. Yes. And, and, you know, and I've I've had people approach me and says, "What do you have against women?" Because I don't put women in my work. And it's like nothing, nothing I mean, at all. I uh, politically, I will, I will, I will go to bat for um, for any woman, you know, uh, it, 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 at my to my detriment, mm -hmm. you know, like so. Uh, I've I've given up spots for somebody else, yeah, in, because I thought it would be the fair thing to do. Yes, but when it comes to the content of my work, mm -hmm. like I'm the only narrator. Yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, and I really want to make sure that what, what I create is something that feels true to me and, and, and you know, and I'm not channeling someone else's uh, vision and, and telling someone else's story. Yeah. And I just, you know, I, I want to be a, a, as real as I can be. And, you know, but I also know that um, I used to have a lot more sales when, when I painted women. <laughs> Well, I know a lot of, you know, women in the art world who love your work and love you as a person, and I'm sure they understand. And it's just, you know, 
it's, it's just the public perception. I think we're in a time now where, you know, perception is being miscommunicated, you know, um, and I say that in a sense to where, and you said it too, it's like, because you paint men doesn't mean that you hate women because you're focusing on a part of a content. You're just trying to tell that side of the story. It doesn't mean that the other side isn't important as well. It's just that there may be someone else telling that side of the story. So you're finding your lane. And I, I think that's, you know, what artists are about, you know, like being able to find the story that, you know, is able to be detailed. I mean, when we think about something like film, you know, how many times have we seen something like, you know, how many documentaries of the JFK assassination, unfortunately, from so many different perspectives and, you know, each decade there's new findings, there's, you know, a hidden camera view or new technology because people are studying different parts of that. It doesn't make it more important than the whole story, you know, and I think that's where, at least today, you know, for the time and I, you know, the pandemic's a pretty weird time anyway, but, you know, for this time, I think people, you know, are just getting emotional and, you know, pulling out small parts and allowing it to affect them instead of figuring out how each piece affects the whole. Right, right. So yeah, we, I, I really enjoyed, I really, really, really enjoyed this talk today, brother. Like this was, you know, I wanted to make sure that folks had a quick background on the pieces and especially for myself too, if I'm being a little selfish because I love the work and I want to, you know, always learn more about the, the artists that I work with and especially the great work that you all bring to the show and, you know, you entrust me in curating and, you know, I, I spent days, you know, before the opening, just looking at these and, you know, thinking about what they would mean and how people would um, approach them and, you know, what would they think? And I think as a curator, that's my greatest reward besides working with the artists is that I get an opportunity to sit with these pieces days and before, you know, days before and watch them go up, be able to you know, assist in your vision of presentation. You know, I think that's a huge honor and I'm, I'm super thankful, brother, super thankful. I'm, I'm thankful to you. I, I, re I really appreciate the invitation and I really uh, wanted to do something with you. I mean, I have a lot of respect yes, for you in, in, in your intellect, your vision. And I, I really uh, am, you know, really thankful that, you know, to, to be a part of it. I, I, uh, I hope we, we we get to do it again. Yeah. Again. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And it's 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 coming. You know, some good stuff in the works, and you know, I'm I'm looking forward to it, brother. So for everyone, uh, the show is still open. It'll be open till February 20th. Um, open Wednesday through Saturday at ArtShare LA in downtown Los Angeles. You can also check out their website, uh, ArtShareLA.org, for more information and. Definitely get down there and see it. Uh, I could be biased and saying this, but it's an amazing show. Um, and other people have said it as well. So do yourself a favor and check it out. Um, thank you again. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Abel, for being here, brother. And, you know, oh, I, you I just wish you the, the greatest week. And, you know, we'll be talking soon for more stuff. That's a, that's a guarantee. <laughs> All right. Take care, brother. Thank you, brother. Have a good one. You too. Bye.